I've, I've been in the movie business for a long time. I was very fortunate. I had uh, really top level jobs at Warner Brothers and, and Universal Studios. And I was like a very young, hotshot executive traveling the world, you know, million, ten, hundred million dollar yachts, partying with rock stars and producers and directors and cutting deals. And part of the part of the whole thing of that was like, you know, parties and alcohol and taking people out for dinner and drinks and $300 bottles of wine and expense accounts. Of course, I didn't have to pay for any of this, which was great. But, um, and, and that was just part of the whole thing. And so, and I grew up like in the foreign service, my father and my mother, you know, we grew up overseas and their job was to give cocktail parties so that we could steal people's secrets and help, you know, foreign policy. This is the Knocking Doors Down podcast, your host, Jason Lachance. And uh, through my addiction recovery and struggles with anxiety and depression, I uh, dug into my passion for speaking with those who have turned their darkest times into their greatest advantages. And that's what Knocking Doors Down is all about. I'm hanging out with Ted Perkins today, uh, Recovery Movie Meetups, as well as Recovery Movie Meetups Workbook, uh, your interactive study and discussion guide to the top 20 films about addiction and recovery. So you're hitting two things I'm passionate about film and recovery and uh, it's cool to hang out with you ted well thanks for having me yeah it is kind of a cool mashup jason i mean who doesn't love movies and uh i've really realized that uh through research that movies have a lot of things that can really help people in recovery and addiction so i thought i'd, I'd uh and I'm, I'm really happy to be on your show to be able to talk it all through i mean not a lot of people know about us we're new but um it's catching on across the country and it's kind of exciting so i'm, I'm really happy to be here Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Uh, and we'll get into a little more later. Uh, I, you know, we met through mutual friend Ben Tuff and his yeah. uh, Swim Tuff documentary, which is phenomenal. I sent him a video of me crying at the end of it. Beautiful. But uh, but it takes <laughs> takes me back to one of my mentors. He would say uh, in recovery, good people know good people. So this is one of those instances. So, um, again, a real pleasure. Uh, but I, I like to focus on. Um, Gratitude, it's a big part of it, a big part of mindset and everything. It's one of the first things I do in the morning. So three things you're grateful for this morning, Ted, if uh, if you can think off the top of your head. Oh, well, the one thing that I'm always grateful, uh, grateful for when I wake up is that I'm not going to go to 7-Eleven and buy a 12-pack of, uh, of sparkling cider. And um, I'm also grateful that I'm alive, healthy, and productive, and really living at my, I think, my best potential both as a father, a parent, a friend, a colleague, and a professional in this industry, and, and that I can do and I can channel, uh, you know, good, positive things to, to help people. I really, I think it's, it's wonderful. And I'm, I'm grateful for, uh, you know, the friends I've made and like you and the friends that I'm making and just this uh, network of people that want to help other people uh, through this issue of, of addiction recovery. I mean, it's just, it's an incredible opportunity. And I don't like to say give back because I don't think anybody gave me anything necessarily. I think it's often uh, uh, not used in the right context. But I, I do think that um, all of us in the recovery space, like you, like Ben, sharing stories of what's worked for them and what's what's given them hope and resilience and success. It's just so wonderful to inspire others because there's a lot of people in a kind of like a dark place. And Anything to kind of lift them out is, I'm sure, music to their ears. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And I think, boy, more than now, the last last four years of our society and, and just globally, really, uh, I yeah. mean, there's a huge impact on, on so many people. But I could get off on a tangent there. Um you know, I, I'm I'm really, you know, I'm curious how how did the movie come about or or doing, you know, recovery movie meetups? Uh, have you been in the film and entertainment industry? Is this just oh, yeah. something you're oh, a yeah. passion for? OK, yeah, uh, sure. There's a there's a funny origin story, you know, like um, I was bitten by a radioactive spider and I decided to no, I'm just <laughs> no, um, I uh, I've, I've been in the movie business for a long time. I was very fortunate. I had uh, really top level jobs at Warner Brothers and, and Universal Studios. And I was like a very young hotshot executive traveling the world, you know, million, ten, hundred million dollar yachts, partying with rock stars and producers and directors and cutting deals. And part of the 
part of the whole thing of that was like, you know, parties and alcohol and taking people out for dinner and drinks and $300 bottles of wine and expense accounts. Of course, I didn't have to pay for any of this, which was great. But um, and, and that was just part of the whole thing. And so and I grew up like in the Foreign Service, my father, and my mother, you know, we grew up overseas and their job was to give cocktail parties so that we could steal people's secrets and help, you know, foreign policy. And, and so, you know, I grew up in this culture of like parties, parties, parties. And I loved it. And it was never a problem. I never thought it was a problem. Um, and then um, over time, as uh, I got more into the producing and the screenwriting side of things, and I had relatively uh, decent success. You know, I sold a lot of screenplays. I've just sold two TV scripts. Um, one is in active development. Uh, it's probably going to end up at Netflix wow. um, after the strike. So I've got a whole like, you know, career that's still going in that sector. But, um, you know, as most writers will tell you or producers, there's times where you're just waiting around for somebody to give you the money to make the movie, or you're waiting around for the producer to say, yes, they like the script and they're going to go forward and, you know, commission the second act or whatever. And so in those moments, I was, uh, you know, that procrastination side of me was saying, well, I could start another script and be a good boy, or I could like, you know, just kind of drink some cocktails and, and just make a day of it and just kind of relax and chill out because, I made a bunch of money and I don't have to work and I'm just waiting for the next, you know, script to come around and life's good. Let's go, you know, hang out at the beach and have some cocktails. And so that became day drinking and that turned into like round the clock drinking. And, you know, very quickly, as you know, these things, you know, can quickly spiral out of control just because of the nature of what addiction is. And I just thought that this is ridiculous. So I, I stopped drinking. I went to smart recovery meetings. I went to AA meetings. I read every book about addiction and recovery. I'm a, I'm kind of a voracious reader when I come to like focusing in on what I'm interested in. And I thought, well, you know, I've got time on my hands. Why don't I watch movies? And I knew that there were like a lot of good movies about addiction. Um, some of them pretty brave, not a, not a lot of them very popular because it's kind of a, like a bummer subject, whatever. But I realized that wasn't true. And so I watched a hundred, I gave myself a challenge. I'm going to watch a hundred movies about addiction and recovery in a hundred days. Because I figured all right, somebody's telling me to do 90 meetings in 90 days. I'm going to do a hundred movies in a hundred days. So I did. And then um, I learned so much from that experience and it opened my eyes to so many themes and characters and things that I found relatable in my own story of recovery and other stories of recovery that I'd heard that I wrote this book called Addicted in Film, Movies We Love About the Habits We Hate, <laughs> available on Amazon right now. But um, it's, a, it's just a great book about, I, I mean, I think it's a great book because I wrote it, but um, it got so well reviewed and people just kind of like were so enthusiastic about the message that movies could really have interesting, deep, reflective um, things to say about the journey, about the struggle, about you know, things that could help other people in recovery. So I quickly turned it into the Recovery Movie Meetups workbook and program, which is a mutual support meeting format that's now being adopted in recovery community organizations, sober homes, uh, detox centers, and, and treatment facilities around the country and the world. Um, and it's just kind of grown out of that. And, and people are starting meetings left and right. And it's become this thing, which is just delightful. I mean, I, I, yes, it was my intention to have that happen. I just didn't think it was going to happen this fast and this successfully with so much great feedback from the community that verifies that this actually does help people. And I'm, I'm just delighted that, that it's being helpful within people's lives and their recovery. Absolutely. I think it's, it's wonderful. A, as a person that studied film, loves film, uh, TV, I, you know, I, I would say it's one of the things I still struggle probably tuning down a little bit. You know, I'm a I'm a pretty good binge watcher, which uh, would parallel my drinking. I was a pretty much a binge drinker. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I just think it's a beautiful way to get across because some people aren't, you know, they're not necessarily auditory listeners. They're not readers mm -hmm. per se, and they learn a lot through film mm -hmm. and you know, it's it's part of that storytelling that we can pass along and share. And so, uh, you know, kudos yeah. to you and whoever else is working with you on this. I think it's a brilliant idea. And I'm I'm oh, well, thank you. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do what I can to help you. If there's places that it's not already happening, I'll be in any contacts I have help it happen. Oh, thanks. So. Thanks, Jason. Well, you hit on something very elemental about um, recovery. And I one of the I, I love to do thought experiments mm. with myself. And I write about several of them in the book as well. But one of them was if somebody went to rehab, let's say for 30 days, and they had like severe problems, would they get the same benefits out of a rehab if they were wearing a blindfold 
for all their meetings? Like if they were blind, like would they get the same results? And the answer to me was like, probably yes, because, um, you know, the recovery and treatment as good as it can be. And, and, you know, thank God that there's rehab and I've got nothing against the rehab industry. They do wonderful. They're doing God's work as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, under very difficult circumstances, understaffed, lots of turnover, not huge budget, especially recovery community organizations. It's tough. But, you know, one of the things that, um, that happens is that it's very text-based, like you said, it's very anecdotal based. And there is sort of like when, when people do what like an AA or 12 step are called drunk logs, you know, when people describe their rock bottoms, you know, those, when people talk and they tell a story, people are modeling what that looks like in their mind. Mm -hmm. So they're creating a visual movie like reference in their mind of what that looks like. People early in recovery, they don't have a huge capacity. Their imagination has been stunted to a certain degree by alcohol or drugs. And so they're kind of like listening, but they're not creating in their mind. Um, and also, or they're not listening because they just don't want to listen. And also, a lot of times people frown on those drunk logs in AA meetings because they think that they might hurt people or they might be, those are not the kind of messages that they want to convey. Now, on the, on the flip side, if you show a movie about, you know, addiction recovery and suffer, somebody suffering from alcohol use or whatever, or a rock bottom, and you show that as an objective representation of what a drunk log would have been in narrative form, it's so much more powerful because people react emotionally to faces and other people. And they don't, they don't react to workbooks and, and text the same way they do faces because we're very social animals. We're looking at people all the time. We're looking at ourselves all the time. And we're looking at ourselves in, in juxtaposition and in reference and comparison to other people. So the social aspect, the cumulative social impact of watching movies in group is exponentially more powerful than just simply watching them on your own without context. So, and we've found that in these recovery movie meetups is that people are like literally opening up and talking when they haven't said a word for the last three weeks, suddenly you can't get them to shut up. They're like, I love it. And then somebody will say, oh my God, yeah, remember that scene from that movie? That's exactly like what happened to me. And all of this is in the safety of a controlled environment with therapeutic support and the support of a community so that people can talk through these scenes and not have to relive them in their own life. So, and that's, and that's sort of what we call, you know, my advisory committee calls, you know, the power of vicarious learning, you know, your mm -hmm. vicarious association with harmful things is actually very therapeutic. Yeah, no, absolutely. I know that uh, when we were talking, you know, separate of the podcast and I, I brought up a certain movie that was impactful for me, uh, clean and sober with Michael Keaton, you know, my I grew up in a home of of addiction, and uh, the movie just kind of showed up. And my mom knew me as a I was a very strange kid, Ted. I was a kid that could <laughs> could watch, uh, you know, uh, First Blood, the first Rambo movie, and then jump to On Golden Pond, you know, with Henry Fonda. And I'm talking like eight, nine years old. Uh, and then eventually, I found Clean and Sober, and it was kind of, you know, my first somewhat light into wow, okay, this, you know, this guy's, this, this thing controls this guy, not the other way around. And so, mm -hmm. uh, ironically, then, then to mirror a lot of what happened in that movie in some way. So still one of my favorites, but, uh, but you're yeah. right. It, it, you know, it is such an impactful learning tool. I was, uh, I taught marketing for five years and sometimes PowerPoints and graphs and all this shit in the kids' ears, but you sit in a, in a movie. You know, I did a documentary on Nike and the rise of Arnold Schwarzenegger and these different things, and it's like, you know, the synapses are firing, light bulbs are going mm -hmm. off, and yeah, you know, yeah. it's such an impactful and powerful medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we we are like human beings. It's our entire brain makeup and evolution is based on a highly adapted and perfected sense of vision and retention and mental modeling. It all works together. And addiction is a mental model. It's a subjective experience of the mind. And so, you know, using objective representations of addiction and recovery, success and failure are what sort of modify people's mental models of their addictions and then affect their decisions of what they do in the objective real world. Yeah. after after they get out of rehab or what they do in their their life of recovery afterwards
while you're checking knocking doors down out don't forget to hit the subscribe button and if you get a lot out of this podcast share with a friend and don't forget the archive of interviews we have bam margera brandon novak kat von d charlie sheen edward furlong kelly osborne the list goes on and on of amazing guests that have been on the podcast sharing how they have found purposeful lives speaking of purpose how about a lifestyle brand with purpose 5150 ltm that's right not only is it a lifestyle brand that can fit whatever it is you're trying to achieve in life but they give back to the community and you the listener of knocking doors down get 20 percent off every time you shop at 5150 LTM. All you have to do is use the code KDD20 at checkout and get 20% off. And how does 5150 give back to the community? Portions of the sales benefit the Carlos Vieira Foundation. Their three amazing programs, the race to end the stigma, the race for autism, and the race to be drug free. More on the Carlos Vieira Foundation, go to carlosvierafoundation.org. Yeah, one of my uh, a gentleman who's been a mentor of mine helped me understand, and I'm probably going to screw it up, but you know, he he said, think about what we use our our hearing for that sense, and he mm-hmm. goes, most of it is is uh, for recall of things. You know, it's why it's harder to learn a language when you're hearing it and things along those lines. Think about the guy that still listens to the same music he did 40 years ago, isn't it open to hearing new things? It's the familiarity and all these things. But with visual, you know, we will take and continue to take in new information that way. And I was like, huh, OK, that that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And also, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a presentation about this. It's a, some ideas that I've been working on for uh, the uh, there's a. There's a multiple pathways of recovery conference in Des Moines that I'm going to be speaking and presenting at. And one of the ideas that I'm going to put forth is that, um, you know, at its elemental sense, a recovery is sort of like a very key moment of changing your mind and changing your mind is, is very difficult because it's the ego and yourself, et cetera, is completely buttressing and protecting itself. You know, you wake mm-hmm. up, you think you know who you are. This is what I am. This is what I do. This is what I want to do. Nobody can change that. So we're defend- We're very defensive naturally because of our ego. Um, and changing addictive behaviors is changing ourselves, our identity, what we do and how we live our lives. That's a, you know, that's a cataclysmic change of mind. And um, one of the points I'm trying to make is that, um, like, look at, for instance, how millions of people were forced to change their minds about things that were very important. And because changing your mind about addiction is like probably one of the most important decisions you can make in your life, quite frankly, it might save your life. Um, And so I thought, well, you know, think about Napalm Girl and how that photo of the girl running away from the napalm bombs naked in the middle of the jungle really changed that millions of people's opinion about the Vietnam War or how, you know, the pictures of people, white guys with fire hoses in Selma, Alabama, you know, firing at little black kids, how that changed the course of an entire generation's public perception of racism. Or even more, more recently, like the, the poor polar bear on a little sliver of ice floating in the middle of nowhere, that, that sort of like woke up everybody's ideas about, you know, global warming because they could see you know, emotionally connect with that. And, and that's, a, and you know, that, that sort of is a very sort of heavy handed comparison, but in a sense, you know, when you're ch- changing your mind about something really, really big, I think visual representations of what's going on are really is what's going to get you to the finish line because, you know, there's several different things you could use. You can use shame, you can use violence, you can use threats, you can use jail time, you could use rock bottoms, pain, hallucinogenic, whatever it is. But at the very foundations, you're making a change in your mind. And changes are driven by what we see around us, what we see others do around us, and how we can see ourselves projected forward successfully in recovery by seeing successful recovery on screen. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, we utilize, I work at, as I was telling you, a nonprofit, Parents and Addicts in Need, and, you know, we, we bring a lot of awareness and in, in going in and speaking about the fentanyl crisis and oh, God bless you. God bless you. it really hits when you show <laughs> some of these younger people, the impact of happening, especially with stuff like, like 
like Trank, the uh, tranquilizer fentanyl mix or or uh, benzo dope or one of these things. And you show them a video of someone that's in that or someone that because of their usage has started to rot off an appendage or whatever. And it's like, yeah, oh, yeah. OK, yeah. you're not full of it. Yeah, th- th- this is real. This is really yeah. happening. This is what yeah. occurs. This is where it will go if you continue down this road. It is a, a freaking guarantee. OK, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's um, good. If you do that, I mean, you know, scare tactics, they call them scare tactics, whatever, but that works uh, a lot of times, you know, shame works a lot of times, but, but, you know, pain and shame and all those other things, they have a mixed history as well. You know, sometimes sure. people get so scared that they go back to using, or they get so shamed that they go back to using, you know, nobody's, no two options are the best, but I think showing representations and having people decide on their own and have it be their idea, as opposed to somebody telling them what to do. That's that's what powerful movies can do is they don't tell you what's right or wrong. They offer you the opportunity to make those conclusions yourself. And when you make those conclusions yourself, it's more powerful. Remember that film Inception where they go into the guy's brain and they change his one key thing about what he thinks about what he's going to do with his father's empire. And by changing that, the trick is. Yes, they change it, but they have to make it seem like it was his idea. And that's the only way that the change is going to stick. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I and I think the ability to, in addition to what you're talking about, when, when you see it play out in a, a narrative story, the narrative of the story or however it goes, is you can allow the person to accept hope into themselves that, oh, oh, I can. Yeah, y- y- yeah, you can. Not only can you see that and then hear all these other people talk about their stories, there's hope. There totally is hope. And, you know, you're no different, worse or better than anyone uh, in recovery. You've got a similar sort of circumstance. Everybody's different. But, you know, the goal is the same, a healthy, happy, productive life, free of, uh, you know, an addiction that's sort of like the monkey on your back that is kind of running your life. Nobody wants to live a life in a cage. Um, you know, we want freedom and we have decisions and we have free will and we have all these decisions that we could make. But with freedom, as they say, uh, comes responsibility. And, you know, we have to be make responsible choices um, and choose what to do and what not to do. And um, some choices are better than others, <laughs> as we have we learn the hard way. Yeah. Hey, Ted, for a guy that worked for Warner Brothers, you made two DC or two Marvel references in this podcast. Sure. <laughs> to, to the Sorry spider. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. See, I'm a comic geek, so I just, uh, I'm busting your balls, Ted. I'm busting your balls. It's all right. I'll, I'll bring up Batman or Superman at some point. Okay, perfect. All right. Nailing on my favorite there, Batman. I, You know, Ted, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, you just your childhood was so intriguing. I got to jump back to it. My goodness. Uh, <laughs> tell me about little Ted and growing up. I mean, you're like, yeah, my parents are liquoring people up so they can get some some international secrets here. True story. Absolutely true story. You know, my father was a foreign service diplomat uh, from, you know, grew up in South Bend, Indiana, took the foreign service exam, spoke uh, Spanish for reasons that we still don't know why. He liked Spanish, studied studied Spanish literature, whatever, met my mom. My mother's from a Spanish immigrant family from Spain. She spoke Spanish. So, you know, they got married and then uh, he passed the foreign service exam and 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 they sent him off into the world. And, you know, we went into these hotspots like Guatemala during, you know, the rebel rebellion against local president where the ambassador was shot. I had bulletproof cars and a, and a secret service guy assigned to me. You know, my father had round the clock protection and my, we lived in fear that we might get assassinated at any time. I, I was hanging out at the ambassador's kid's pool the day he was assassinated and the Marines came in, swept in and told us all to go home. And I mean, I was in I was in South Korea at the time when like the Korean jetliner was shot down by the Japanese. And we happened to live across the street from the Japanese embassy and the whole army fucking came in. And, you know, the Marines came with smoke bombs to air back us. I, I've lived through some crazy stuff, but. It really, it sounds like a little bit crazier than it is, um, but it was really kind of that crazy. But the fun part of it was the fact that my father's, anybody in the Foreign Service, their job at certain levels is to give parties and to host events because diplomacy is really all about getting people liquored up. You want to get the premiere of this and that. you got to get the intelligence service guy and the general, I don't know what. 
and the prime minister all in a room, get them liquored up and start telling them how democracy is the greatest thing in the world, how the United States is there for them and how alliances with the West are fantastic and how, you know, we're going to help you with your international trade. And, and so all these things go together in a social setting, which is very fueled by not drugs at all. There's no drugs in that, but alcohol and smoking. And I just remember being at parties all the time, like every weekend there was a party. My mother's job was to, we would go to the, we would go to the PX and, and buy, you know, six huge bottles of gin and like four bottles of whiskey and like, you know, three cartons of cigarettes. And that was just for the weekend because we're having a party. I mean, like I, I, I knew like the president of Guatemala, I knew what kind of drink he liked. So I would serve him that drink. And so I was, I was part of that. And, and part of that, my father and I, you know, I knew that he was trying to get information that he would pass along to the CIA. So I would like do little recons here and there. We lived in Guatemala, South Korea, Italy, Mexico, Venezuela, South Korea. Uh, God, um, you know, all these crazy places. And everywhere we went, we gave parties and we generated intel. And wow. what we did with that intel, I don't know. Who knows? I, you know, there's a part, and I wrote a script about this. And this actually, um, uh, uh, at some point, uh, I, I had, uh, who is it? Um, a huge, a big production company had optioned the script, but then they they backed away. But um, I did try to make this into an actual film called uh, Best of Enemies. Huh. Um, but uh, it was just a, it's, it was a fascinating life. And alcohol was a huge part of that. And uh, nobody ever thought that that was a problem. In fact, without alcohol, I don't know that U.S. foreign policy would be the same. Quite frankly, wow. um, and and I don't think I don't think U.S. film policy or the success of several of our industries would be the same without alcohol. You know, alcohol is a key driver of how we engage in business with Asia yeah. um, and Latin America and you know Europe. Well, basically everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I was uh, uh, I'm always fascinated by by you know people that are. Uh, very studious and have degrees and talking about different stuff. And um, this pissed off somebody in a meeting when I shared this, but it's true. Uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson said, you know, one of the best uh, uh, anxiety drugs, if not the best out there is, is alcohol. And it's not so much that, you know, the ambitions don't go there. It's the anxiety of the after effect of that decision that is, quill that is, is suppressed and so people will in those moments make lots of situations i can think of things that i said that i would have never have talked about sitting sober but i would have never have revealed about life and other stuff you know yeah. so it's um wow fascinating so you were kind of this is kind of cold war era and post cold war when you guys yeah were oh yeah no, absolutely we you know i joined uh i i remember being an anti-reagan protests in Spain, I remember, you know, protests in Guatemala against U.S. hegemony and, and what uh, Kermit Roosevelt was doing in the country with our Benz and the president um, and the, you know, and the way that uh, you know, all the strife in Central America I was part of. I went to, um, you know, we didn't do Eastern Bloc. We were more like, you know, Latin America, Spain, that kind of stuff and, and Asia. But um but uh, there are, yeah, there it was right during the Cold War. I mean, we, in fact, part of the story that I wrote in this is that, you know, when we met our Russian counterparts, it was all like, whoa, spooky. Like, you know, in right. one of my schools, there was the daughter of the, the KGB guy and she was like beautiful and everybody wanted to talk to her, but you couldn't talk to her because she's like the enemy. Right. Um, and so it was, it was just this very strange, uh, one of my friends en ended up talking to her. She ended up being really nice. She's like, why doesn't anybody talk to me? <laughs> and it's like, well, because apparently you guys want to blow up the world. So, you know, you should, like, <laughs> talk to your people and try to stop doing that. You know, it's just, it was all very, from a very innocent uh, perspective. We didn't, you know, we didn't really understand it at that point. We didn't understand the nuances of, you know, big politics and everything. But, you know, we didn't know enough to know that, um, you know, we were Americans trying to do America's work in the world and that there were p uh, forces of opposition that were against us and that we needed to be careful about who we talked to, what we say, said, and to always reflect well on American values and ourselves. Because one of the things that my father all, and my mother always warned us, don't be a persona non grata. 
a person that that is like seen by this country as as like a rude American. And, you know, over the years, it's it's just been horrifying to see how Americans act overseas and how some Americans view other countries and the xenophobia that's developed over time, which is um, which is sad. But, you know, there's there's reverse xenophobia in other countries as well. So I can't sort of like wave the banner of like self-righteousness in that regard. But but I do remember that, um, you know, reflecting America well was my job as a kid. And I was mm. like eight years old and I'm like, yeah, I'm a diplomat too. I'm a diplomat's son. Right. Wow. And you're your only child. Yes. No, I have a sister. And oh, do you? Son. Yeah. I have a sister. She's, she's a nurse and, and she lives in Louisville. She, she had the same upbringing. Wow. <laughs> oh my gosh. She, she sees uh, it differently than I do. We have different uh, uh, forms of recollection. She was more focused on, she was two years older. She was more focused okay. on guys. I was more focused on doing crazy stuff and like getting involved in, you know, spying on people or whatever all right or politics or you know wow right even send my i would even send myself out on recon missions really <laughs> okay you gotta share me oh, one, because i can see a kid like me probably would have ended up in getting in some harm's way so yeah well you know that movie spy kids yeah that, that, that was me without the special effects man wow i did this is i could go on with this forever I know what you're talking about alcohol or James Bond. <laughs> but either way, I mean, but that whole thing, like it, it, think about it though. Think about the link. Let's go back to, you know, addiction. Think about how shaken, not stirred James yes. Bond, a glamorous life, alcohol central to his character, you know, yeah. must have his drink, you know, alcohol problems, part of his background myths, you know, mythological background story. When he's sad or loses somebody drinks heavily. It's, you know, that's, basically part of the whole, you know, the, the life of like an international complete human being is drinking and right. drinking a lot, which is, which is, you know, a sad message. So when really though, do you start drinking though? At what age does alcohol come into your life personally, as far as you using? Well, I've been drinking alcohol since I was like, you know, 17, but, but not to the point where I couldn't function or do stuff. I mean, I sure. get really drunk sometimes, just like most kids, like college, everybody drank a lot. And we, you know, I only had like a blackout maybe once or twice, but you know, fraternities and crazy drink, everybody did. So, and then I got into my professional life and I got much more serious and buttoned up and, you know, I, I would drink socially and stuff, but I would usually it was like only on the weekends. I wouldn't drink during the week if, if, as I recall, because I was busy and, you know, working hard and I wanted to get some sleep so I could work hard the next day and make money and be successful. Um, but I did find that like when I was traveling, you know, first class lounges and overseas travel and 12 hour flights to China, those were opportunities to just kick back and drink. So I enjoyed that. But then, you know, it's like they say, it was fun until it wasn't. Um, yeah. And uh, just I think in my early 40s, I started to discover that, wow, this is really not cool. This is just kind of like going to be a problem. And so I just decided to stop and start going to meetings. And I'd had some false starts. I'd quit for a year, then go back, quit for two years, then go back. But now I've been sober for several years. I don't even count the years because I don't want to jinx it. And I'm just super, super happy. I Now I know one thing to be true and that, uh, and, and it's just an absolute truth that just makes my life so much easier because I don't have to mind fuck myself over this question. Is it, I know that I just can't have one drink and then just leave it at that. I'm just not that guy, you know? And so you know, knowing that is kind of like a security blanket. So I just don't ever do it. End yeah. of story. And and I and I know that if I do do it, it's just it might take a while, but I'm just going to the same place. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to go to that place. Yeah, and that's such a valid point to bring up because we'll our mind will want to get back to that level really fast that we were at. Yeah. Well, as they say in the start of uh, your favorite movie, Clean and Sober. Uh, the actor who plays uh, doing the monologue says one thing about that you never forget. You don't. You never forget your addiction. Your brain will always, when it gets that drug again, even if you've been sober for 30 years, you have it, your brain remembers and they're like, great, we're back in business. Exactly. Yeah. It it, it will re-hijack your reward system really fast. <laughs> absolutely. 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 Right away. And guaranteed too. There's no, no question about it. Oh yeah. I remember one of my fall-offs after my first stint. I was, I kind of had that too. 
you know, a little over a year, just <clears throat> about at two years. And then now I'm two, it's just over two and a half years this time around. I'm kind of like you. I'll, I'll leave it on my phone. I don't need to remember the hours, minutes, seconds, because then I'll obsess over it. And that's really bad for me. But yeah, I mean, I, I remember the first real fall off. It was, it was right back into a, a 12 pack of beer and shots that night, you know, no problem. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it always goes back to the same place. And you know, it's funny. I have um, a six pack of non-alcoholic beer here. I occasionally I'll have a non-alcoholic beer and uh, I don't, I haven't found any that I like, but I did find one that I think is, you know, fairly decent. I did like the taste of beer. I think it goes with certain foods. Same. Um, and so um, I, you know, it takes me like maybe three weeks to drink a six pack, but it's sitting there in this lower shelf of the, of my refrigerator. And I saw it this morning and I looked at it and there's a part of me that was like, Oh yes, totally. Gonna make a day of it. Six pack of beer. I forgot that I left it there. Phenomenal. I'll get some more this afternoon. And it just, this whole thing flashed in my brain for like three milliseconds. And then I started laughing, but it just, it, it reminds us, and this is like a lesson for all of us. And I'm sure a lot of your audience can, can identify with this is that there's a little movie waiting to be replayed and it's just, you're just waiting to hit the pause button. And the minute you hit the pause button, it'll replay the most wonderful feelings and images of how great it was to drink or use just to tempt you because that little movie is in your head. It's never going to go away. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might push it way back into the back of your cerebellum, but it ain't going to go away and you can't delete it. It's one of those files you just can't delete. Yeah. No, I definitely have a few of those reservations of thinking, Oh, a little bit later on in life and the little lady and I, you know, we, we can afford that Bora Bora vacation. And what's the harm of the, the one yeah. Mai Tai, and it's like, because it has whole, it won't be one Mai Tai, that's why. No, no you, know? you won't remember your whole vacation will go down the toilet. You'll end up having a huge fight, like, by in, within 12 hours. Oh, guaranteed. Guaranteed. I, 12 hours might be kind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, shit, howdy. Yeah, I, yeah, I was work, talking with a newcomer at a meeting last week, and I just said to him, and it, it's funny because... Uh, this didn't occur to me either. I just said, well, you know, if you don't drink or use, you can't get drunk or high. And it was like the biggest light bulb for him. I'm like, yeah, fucked me up the first time I heard it too. That's fine. That, uh, yeah. That, uh, how inconvenient the way that goes. <laughs> yeah. How am I going to live the rest of my life without getting drunk or high? I mean, can somebody tell me how that works? Well, that's what you have to, that's what recovery is. You have to learn how to live without drugs or alcohol or those behaviors, you know, and, and it takes time. Nobody likes to learn anything. People are kind of like naturally reticent to change and, and to learn or to, you know, we live in a society where we want a pill for everything. You know, we want instant gratification and, and um, you know, the, the, the popularity of Ozempic, you know, for weight loss, et cetera. I mean, everybody wants the quick fix, the magic, magic bullet and recovery really, you know, I think makes more sense the, the more difficult it is, the longer it takes, but the more genuine the effort, the longer it'll last, the more successful it'll be. You know, people have to realize like, like you or me, a lot of people, they just have to roll up their sleeves and do the work, you know, go to the meetings or read the books or, you know, do the therapy or, you know, and every time that they overcome an, a, an urge, that's, that's a learning experience. That's, that's part of the work, you know, as unpleasant as it is to go to your friend's wedding and, be sitting in the back, you know, sipping on soda with no alcohol and everybody else is having a great time. Sorry, not sorry. Too bad. So sad. But, you know, that's the work of recovery. And you get out of that thing. And God, you're going to feel so great about yourself for not, you know, succumbing to the, the your urges. You know, every time you overcome that, that's a huge victory, you know, and you put those victories in your in your vault and you look at those trophies when you wake up every day. You're like, damn, fuck, I'm killing it in my recovery. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and keep those moments close, you know, because you said it, you know, I, I think it, there's no shortcuts in this and we're in a society that, that, like you said, with the pill for every yield gives us a lot of shortcuts. I mean, I forget what the statistics are. We're something like close to 10% <laughs> of the world's population in the U S yet we consume, consume 95% of the prescription medications, especially in the area of pain, opioids, so on and so forth. It's yep. like, yeah. You know, we look for a, we're, we're a society that gives a lot of shortcuts and justifies your shortcuts. And, 
and mm-hmm. I, and in a lot of ways applauds people for the shortcuts and yeah and i'm absolutely. sorry you, this this thing this this recovery you're not going to be able to fucking shortcut it it's not going to work no absolutely we we love people who get rich very quickly and people who had to the majority of people who had to work really hard to create a business and be successful over time very unglamorously you know those are the people that that nobody cares about those guys. Those, those are the schlubs that had to work for a living. You know, we glorify people. That's why we love celebrities so much sure. because they like they become instant sensations and gazillionaires. Nothing against becoming a gazillionaire. That's great, but you know, the the that that's one percent of the people. Like the other ninety nine percent of us literally have to work. You know, and, and and do. But that's life, and that's real life. You know, not celebrity life. Yeah. Well, and I think that's some of the the misguided perception of it, too. I mean, I know you've worked with some top name talent and I've had the pleasure of speaking with a few. And, you know, you know, there's a clawing and a scraping that goes on there, too. You know, 20 yeah. years in the in the uh, radio industry talked with a lot of bands that it's like, yeah, it took us a long time to get that overnight hit. <laughs> it, yeah. You yeah. know, I, well, actually, it's funny. I write about that. And uh, addicted in film, mm. I do write about the fact that, like you know, I, I look at the movie. Um, uh, what is it? The movie with uh, Bradley Cooper, um, "A Star Is Born." Uh, Star Is Born. Sorry, why am I? Uh, yeah, so Star Is Born and uh, country music, and and I, I write a chapter about you know, mamas don't let your uh, your your sons grow up to be country music alcoholics. Um, it's just because <laughs> that's so much part of the the whole mythology, you know, drinking and celebrity and, and everything are sort of all hand in hand. And so I write about those films and, and, um, and also Gia, you know, like how can a supermodel at yeah. the top of her game, you know, what's her, what's her problem? Like you ask yourself, like, aren't these celebrities supposed to be the happiest people on the planet? Well, no, not necessarily. You know, they've got issues just like you and me. And so by using those movies as comparisons, it, it also, tells us something very important about the nature of success and our perceptions of success <clears throat> and how addiction is not something that's isolated. It's, it's sort of like a universal, you know, a philosophically profound issue that everybody encounters, you know, yeah. even movie stars yeah. and music. Stars. Well, and, and, you know, seeing it firsthand and even to, to myself, to a certain extent, I think it fueled a lot of it. Cause I kind of came into my drinking a little bit later and, you know, when it, when I pinpoint where it really took off was moving to a small town, having the number one radio show where we were having one in five males in the area, statistically listening to our show. Uh-huh. And then you go out and you're just like, Oh, I just want to go grab a bite to eat. And then there's somebody there that, you know, this is almost 20 years ago when radio was still a bigger deal, you know, and, uh-huh. and your personality, like radio stations, you are connected to it by your personality, you know? So yeah, being yeah. on the rock station, you go out and somebody's like, man, hey, that was funny. Do a shot with me. Have a beer. And and a yeah, guy with yeah. a fragile little ego like me that was seen, not heard. It's like, everybody sees me, of course, you know, and, <laughs> yeah, the, you know, the girls start coming up to you. It's not the other way around and you're not having to face rejection. You're the one that makes the decision. And so you get a lot of delusions about who you sure. are and where you're at and how important self-important you are and it's all just a bunch of bullshit yeah i mean i i liken addiction to being in a, i call it the addiction matrix you're living in a false reality mm. it's based on your own delusion your self-affirming bias you know you don't look for examples of things that convince you that you have a problem you look for things that that justify your use and so you have uh, cognitive biases and delusions and self and, and, and basically lying to yourself endemically and, and you deal with cognitive dissonance. You're like, it's totally fine. All right, I wrecked the car, whatever, but it's totally fine. You know, how do you live those two, rea- how do you reconcile two opposing realities? Well, you live in the matrix. And so, sure. you know, you can either take the red pill or the blue pill. If you take the blue pill, good luck with that. But if you take the red pill, we're gonna look at what life really is in sobriety. And you'll realize that there's a whole world out there that's might not be as pretty as the world that you're living in, but at least it's real. Yeah. And it's breaking free of that, uh, 
you know, I feel bad. I feel shame. So I drink. And then when you drink, you feel bad, you feel shameful. And it just, it goes around and around and around. And it's like, I want off this. It's being in the, the the world pool that's spinning like, you know, uh, pirates of the Caribbean where the ships are on the outer edge. And it's like, when are they going to fall in? And that's what it is. It's like, when are you going to fall in? Cause at some point you are, you know? Yeah. It's funny. You said that question because you know, does alcohol uh, use cause you shame? Or are you in shame because you're using alcohol? Or what has that, And I ask those kinds of questions in the Recovery Movie Meetups workbook. Those are the mm. types of, you know, leading questions that we ask as part of the workbook. And, uh, you know, and we were related to scenes of movies where we can, they can look at it and like, there's a scene of a movie with, you know, Sandra Bullock feels shame about this. Like, have you felt the same way, et cetera. Sure. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of cool um, how you can relate the scenes from these movies to really powerful uh, questions like you just posited. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, probably 28 days, I'm assuming, if we're taking the Sandra Bullock reference. And oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, for people that haven't seen that, yeah, just think about screwing up her sister's wedding. And, oh, yeah. you know, it's like all these things that it's just like, oh, my gosh, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, and that's a really important film. It's like a kind of like a Hollywood bubblegum film. It's a popcorn movie. It's very entertaining, very funny. Sandra Bullock, so cute, fun, great. But there's some really deep stuff in that movie. Yes, there is. And, uh, you know, when you see it again and you really pay attention, if you see it from the perspective of somebody in recovery, you realize what a, what a powerful film, but what a brave movie to have been made to begin with. How do they get away with making that film? You know, because it's not necessarily something that's, you know, very popular, something that's very commercial. I mean, I used to sit in these meetings where people would pitch me movie ideas and I'd say yes or no. And and if we liked them, we'd put them to the president and he would say yes or no, or she would say yes or no. But, you know, somebody came in and be like, it's a movie about these drug addicts. And I'd be like, stop. No. And, you know, I'm the, I'm the idiot that passed on train spotting. (laughs) That's the first movie that came to my mind when you said movie about drug addicts. I was like, well, train spotting was, like, I just didn't get it because, you know, I didn't see any reason why that would be appealing. I love the movie. But I didn't see it. We didn't want to buy it for Universal. Anyway, so don't. But at any rate, um, but they got that movie made in 20 days. is really important because, you know, and it's a very important film to watch if you're like early in your recovery. Yeah. Because I don't want to give away the ending of the film. But but during that whole most of the second act, um, you know, Sandra Bullock is basically too cool for school. I don't belong here. I'm not like you people. They call on her in group and she's just like curled up in a ball, doesn't want to say anything because this is bullshit. She's just doing this so that she doesn't have to go to jail. She's out in three weeks. You know, it's all good. And as soon as she gets out, she's going to go right back to her thing. It's just an inconvenience for her because she's just phoning it in. But then over the course of the movie, things change and, you know, she changes. And that's, you know, a profound message that that shows us that, you know, if you're just dipping your toe because you're stuck there, because they they force you to go to rehab and you're just phoning it in, watch this story and see kind of like how she comes to understand herself better and what the result is in her life. You know, that's that's very important. And the same thing in Clean and Sober. Michael Keaton is phoning it in. He's trying to get to his drug dealer. He's trying to call, you know, he's trying to scrounge up his, some money from his mom so he can score. You know, he's not really in it to win it. But over time, that changes. Um, yeah. So, you know, those are those are very important films to watch in early recovery. Well, and I think a lot, too, I, I, I those two films I enjoy in particular, especially 28 Days, um, really does a good job of illustrating uh, those you have in proximity of you. You know, when you think about her with her um, relationships, you know, she ends up really creating some healthy barriers and realizing who is and isn't good for her, no matter how much she cares for him. Yeah. yeah. Whereas, you know, 28 days for me uh, is powerful because, you know, not to spoil it, but it's the ramifications of your actions, regardless of whatever state of mind you're in, that you are going to have to deal with it. And he starts to, and he does. And it's like, yeah, the shit's heavy. It, it really is. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, again, don't want to spoil the ending if you've not seen it. Uh, one of my yeah. favorite movies, and I'm a huge Michael Keaton fan. It's like if I could be on screen with that guy for <laughs> two seconds, I would be overjoyed. Um, but it's just got a brilliant ending in the way that it that, that the movie wraps up and the things that he has to deal with mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Yeah. You know, it's uh, mm-hmm. it's that transformative process, which, 
You know, yeah. some people might think it's a little dark, whereas I go, boy, no, that ending is full of hope. Like I, I've seen that movie 20 times maybe, and, and I yeah. cry at the end every damn time while I'm laughing, mind you. So Yeah, yeah, it's a, it, it's a very powerful. And that was the first film that was made by Imagine Entertainment, which was... Um, which is a new production company founded by Ron Howard. Right. Um, and the first, first entertainment company to go public outside of the studio system. And they just had a boatload of money and they, they were able to green light that film at a time when, you know, Michael Keaton wanted a serious role and he was a funny guy. And it was, it was as if, you, you know, it, it's almost like asking Jim Carrey to do Schindler's list. Like there was a total disconnect. Like, why is he doing that? But he's an actor. You wanted to act. You didn't want to be a buffoon. And he did that. And it was very important that he did. Um, and then he went on to do other roles um, that were more serious. And, and now, you know, it's come full circle. He wins the Emmy for Dope Sick, you know, and he's yeah. uh, you know, he's just an amazing human being, it seems like. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, before we get to some random questions, I got to ask, because you, you did a book, tw Top 20 Films About Addiction and Recovery. G give me a couple of those in the top 20 and why you put them there, if you could. Well, thank you for asking. Yeah. <laughs> um, through my advanced selection algorithm. Uh, <laughs> no, I just put a hundred, I just put a hundred movies in Chad GPT and it spit out 20. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, no, I, you know, no watched... shortcuts, Ted, no fucking shortcuts. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So um, yeah, no, I, I, the criteria were no gratuitous, you know, gratuitous use of and consequence free, drug or alcohol use something that shows clear ramifications and, 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 and things that happen consequences um, that involves to some way uh, a character understanding and admitting um, and, and owning up to the fact that there is a problem um, and uh, doesn't have to have a happy ending. Like uh, leaving Las Vegas doesn't necessarily have a happy ending. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, and I also wanted to cover the broad swath of issues um, regarding, you know, Oh, it, drugs of choice and also family issues, personal issues, you know, crime, uh, uh, dishonesty, all those things. And so, like, for instance, I think When a Man Loves a Woman, super important mm, film. Yes. Uh, written, uh, which is which is an amazing film um, directed by a friend of mine, Louis Mandoki, one of the most underrated uh, Hollywood uh, romance directors of all time. Wonderful guy. Mexican. Um, and... Um, <clears throat> And I think the movie is very interesting because on, on the one hand, yes, it is Meg Ryan recovering from addiction to alcohol, but it's also a story that tells us a lot about how a loved one, how, uh, how her husband um, is reacting that, you know, um, Garcia, um, Andy, Andy Garcia, Garcia is brilliant, is, is brilliant in that. And so how, you know, he thinks he can fix it and how he thinks, you know, he's the problem or you know, how could it be that I didn't know that this was a problem? What's wrong with me? So it touches on so many issues of like, you know, people that are, have alcohol as part of their relationship. You know, there's, there's a part of that movie that says that, you know, he knows perfectly well what she's doing. He should have known that she was drinking a lot. He's part of, he loved the happy, funny, drunk wife. You know, he, she was sexy and frisky and funny and happy. And that was part of his thing. And now that she's in rehab and she's come out of rehab, she's not the same person. The sex is not the same. The relationship's not the same. She's not the same. And he's not the same. So it's, it's as uh, Roger Ebert, I think said, it's not so much about her going through recovery. It's him recovering from her recovery. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's a very profound point. And I think anybody who's in a relationship with somebody who has an alcohol or drug issue, or that was an issue in his, his or her relationship, it's a really important film to see. The same thing with Days of Wine and Roses. You know, that's, you know, that's, that's a, that's a wonderful older film that touches on the problems of relationships that are based on alcohol or drugs, not being real love, but just sort of perceived ecstasy. And, and of course, we talked about clean and sober, but I think one of these movies that I think is very interesting um, for people who are, quote, considering, quote, moderation or whatever, or thinking that maybe there's a path that they can drink responsibly or not, um, is the movie, um, which is another what, wonderful one. It's called Another Round. It's a Danish wow. movie. Not seen um, it. It's a Danish movie. It won the Academy Awards the year before last. And it's the premise is phenomenally funny. It's it's these Danish guys that have the most boring jobs in a public school in Denmark, and life is okay, but it's really boring, and they're boring, and they're bored. Um, and so 
one of the guys says, you know, I heard that there's a study of this, some Danish scientist that says that if you keep your blood alcohol at 0 0.05 all day long, you're going to have maximum human potential, pro productivity, happiness, and social engagement and emotional connection to people. And, and that really the problem with humanity is not that we're too drunk. It's that we're not drunk enough. And they're like, well, let's, let's test that out. So they document it all and they start drinking to get to 0 0.05 during the day. And at the very beginning of the movie, there are tangible benefits. I mean, sure. you and I both know, and everybody in your audience knows it, that you, when you're slightly buzzed, some nice fun things can happen. There's no mm -hmm. doubt about it. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, otherwise, why would people drink at all? You know? Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, the history teacher now is suddenly killing it and being really fun and his students really love him and he's kicking and the principal's really happy with him. And then the soccer coach tries something new with the kids that he used to hate. And, you know, he starts to really like the kids because he's slightly buzzed and it opens up him emotionally and they start winning ball games. And the same thing with the, with the choir director, you know, he, he decides to turn off the lights and have everybody sing in the dark and hold hands and, and, you know, they would never have done that if he hadn't been slightly buzzed or had this credit. And so things happen. But of course, I don't, again, I don't want to give away the ending, but of course they're like, well, you know, if, if we're having such a great time at 0.05, do you guys want to try 0 0.07? Should we do that? And then of course the whole thing spirals out of control as, as we all know, but yeah. you know, the whole idea of like uh, the question of, of, you know, is it okay to drink a little bit and can that be sustained? Well, each person, each character in this movie answers that question in a different way, which is reflective of what society is. And for many of us, the, the answer is no, we can't do that. For me, it's no, but for other people, perhaps it is. And we can't be judgmental and, and take the position that like, you know, anybody who drinks is going to be an alcoholic and have right. a problem and they're just heading in the right direction. It might take them a while to get there, but you know, that's where they're headed. Not true, you know, for everybody. Yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> and dude, like you said, not me, not you. <laughs> yeah. But, well, I actually did a thought experiment that I that I tried with. Uh, I, I give a smart recovery meeting every every Wednesday night, and as part of my speech in Des Moines, um, what if there was a, a drug called you know, Buzzaday, which was Buzzaldia or whatever you want to call it, and it's like take one pill and it'll keep your blood alcohol level at point zero five all day long, guaranteed. You don't have to drink. And that's all you're going to get, 0.05. It won't go up. It won't go down. You're going to be 0.05 all day long, guaranteed. Would you take that pill if you are in long-term recovery? Would you take that pill? That's a good question. I, and I yeah. challenge everybody in your audience to think about that question very carefully. Do you want to go back to that state of being kind of buzzed and have that be something that is part of your life every day? Or are you thinking that maybe being completely sober and clear-headed and yourself is actually a better outcome? I wonder if you did a poll online, I wonder what the outcome of that would be. I know what the outcome of my poll was. And that was that like 85% of people said they would never take a pill like that. Um, and 15 said, yeah, yeah, I think I'd like to take that pill, but they're in a different place in their recovery sure. where they think that that's, you know, okay. And, you know, the, the, the answer to that question varies person to person where they are in their recovery. Somebody in long-term recovery that sees the long-term benefits of recovery think, no, absolutely not. I'm not going to take a pill like that. Somebody early in recovery, who's looking at the fact that their entire social life seems to be obliterated by the fact that they can never drink again would totally take a pill like that. Yeah. You know what my thoughts were, Ted? was, okay, uh, is someone administ administering this to me or is it under my own volition? And if it's under my own volition, I'm not just taking one. Are you fucking no, stupid? No, no, it's, you no, know? no. That's, that's the caveat. Uh, you, you can take as many as you want. It's just point oh, five. Okay. That's, so you can't overdose, <laughs> so you're just wasting your time. Okay, yeah, my, yeah, my point would be, uh, hell no, I'm in the hell no category. Right. Well, I mean, it's the same thing about like, like for instance, if there were, you know, and, and the pharmaceutical companies would try to figure out a way to do this, but um, where like, would it be possible to create a drug that the, the recommended dosage is all that the body would absorb and it would not absorb anything else? Well, bodies don't work like that. You know, yeah. they absorb what's given to them through the brain body barrier um, and they haven't figured out a way to do that. So people have to self-regulate how much they take. That's where addiction comes from. The fact that the body and the brain wants more and you have access to more. And so you give it more and more often. But this is a thought experiment where that's impossible. So a drug like that obviously doesn't exist. If it did, 
you know, would what would people do with that drug? That's that's the thought experiment. But it, but the answer to that question has a little bit more to do with how people see the benefits of recovery overall, and to draw a demarcation between real life and buzzed life, and yeah. and which is more preferable. It's hard. I mean, you, you tell me it, it's hard to get someone to want to embrace the idea of authenticity, especially because a lot of us have just never lived in it. Yes, yeah. it's true. And, 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 and authenticity is kind of a scary thing for people who are not oh, used God, to being yes. authentic, you know, and uh, that smacks of like, whoa, you know, a little voodoo and too close for comfort kind of thing. That's why you used to drink or use because it was too close for comfort. And now you're, you know, confronted with that. And especially in these meetings where everyone's like, well, I want you to share how you feel. And that's, that really, that comes up against, uh, you know, how people have lived their life in many, in many respects. But over time, you know, this authenticity becomes something that's that you celebrate and you enjoy and you start to understand it more and you open up more and you become more a version of yourself, I think, that people can like and, and love and adapt to. And you start to really respect yourself for because it's a process of learning about yourself and realizing that you don't have to have those barriers up all the time and you don't need a substance to take those barriers down. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, and I think it's it helps us differentiate so much. You know, people have asked me you know, what's one of the hardest things you've had to do in your recovery? And it was setting a boundary and saying to an individual that I cared about, I'm sorry, I care about you, but I can't have you in my life anymore. Yep. Yep. And, and yep. it, and it sucks on one hand. And on the other hand, guess what? Making that decision changed my life a whole hell of a lot. And I'm willing to bet changed theirs too. I'm sure it greatly benefited them as well, you know? Because yeah. there was a toxic mix of stuff there. So, it, you know, it's a, it's a lot of these things we have to do. No shortcuts. No shortcuts. And, you know, people, not to be too philosophical, but, you know, um, what are that Jewish uh, Hebrew proverb that says that he who heals himself heals the world or whatever that, that thing is. It's like when you do something good for yourself and you, you fix yourself or you deal with your addiction problems and you recover successfully and the things that you do as a result, that, that ends up being a cascade of causalities projecting f into the future that affect other people in the universe um, as a whole. So, you know, that's very powerful, you know, recovery and, and health have a multiplier effect yeah. on the mental health of other people around you as well. I mean, I'm not saying that, you recovering is going to automatically make your friend recover, but him hearing and seeing your recovery uh, could be, you know, the moment in time where he decides or she decides to make a decision that might change the course of their life and the course of his family's life and his future son and father's life and all that stuff. So it's really profound. Like, you know, it's the, the, cha the moment of changing your mind really is like, it's the start of everything positive right down the line. Yeah, Absolutely. Oh, well, Ted, I could probably talk to you all day, but uh, how about some fun <laughs> random questions, huh? Sure. Love random questions. All right. Uh, being that you are a movie guy and normally, you know, film people tend to have some really good musical taste, too. So uh, you're stranded on a deserted island, uh, but you can only have one movie and one music artist's greatest hits with you. What are they? <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I, I would have the movie Babe. About really little, yeah i'd have that movie and i'd have um and you want the greatest hits album yeah uh i think i would probably have uh led zeppelin's greatest hits nice um so i mean yeah i mean I'd, obviously i'd want more than that but if that's all i had if that's all i had i'd be okay for a while i wouldn't okay. go crazy okay so led zeppelin makes total sense uh where does babe <sighs> come into play why babe a lot of people ask me this question. I, I really, it's hard to really describe, but um, okay. So it's like a little pig and, and, you know, it's these dogs that train it to be a, a, a sheep herder. And it's set in like somewhere in mythic, idyllic Australia or New Zealand or wherever it is. But I just think that um, the, the story reflects something really profound about the best in all of us, which is that, when you're an outsider that comes into a place where you don't necessarily belong, that you can be sad or you could be brave and you can decide to work with the locals or not. And that, you know, that other people, like the dog that's such a bossy dog, the, 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 the father of the pack of the little dogs that are helping him out, 
you know, he has a hearing issue and that's the reason that he's so upset. And so it, there's all these little nuggets in that movie that just tell us a, a tremendous amount of things about human nature, human resilience and hope. And the fact that like this little pig thinks that it could be a sheep herder and they could then go to a contest and win a contest of sheep herders and that everybody thinks that the farmer is nuts and that a farmer who's just doing his thing for his entire life and not make made waves, doesn't want to rock the boat, saw some potential in a little pig and everybody thought he was crazy, but he saw something that nobody else did. And he was right. I, I weep openly at the end of that movie. Every time I see it, I own it. I'll watch it every couple of months. There's a, there's a scene that I know, I know that everybody who's seen this movie knows exactly what I'm talking about. There's a scene where James Cromwell, the, the actor, looks down at the pig and says, that'll do pig. That'll do. See, I'm, I'm tearing up right now. I just can't. It's just That's that fucking okay. movie is just unbelievable. Unbelievable. George Miller is a genius. And then he goes on to do Mad Max. I mean, this yeah. guy's like got such range, you know, yeah. unbelievable. No, I, it gave me chills. I haven't watched that movie in a long time. And it, let alone thought about that scene. <clears throat> everything good about humanity is in there. And it leaves you thinking that, you know what, there's hope. I, it, I don't know why there's a lot of reasons. There's other movies that would do that, but there's just a innate simplicity in it. That's so pure. That makes you feel, you know what? It's okay to be human. We're okay. Yeah. We're not as bad as everybody says. Yeah. And I think we all want someone to have that genuine belief and affirmation that he's giving in that, you know, that'll yeah. do. Now, that'll, I, do. Okay. that'll do. That'll do. I haven't thought about that in a while, but do you want a tissue? Let me hand you a tissue here. <laughs> Pass it through the screen. Um, yeah. I, I, I had my, my, my daughter's nine years old and she's, oh, she wow. starts watching. She's like, what the fuck's with the pig? Do you, I mean, like, so it's a pig? Is that like a real pig or like, he's going to be a sheep herder. That's stupid. He's a pig. I'm like, you just don't get it. So I, just, I She's gotten through half of it, but at some point I got to like sit her down and be like, you don't understand. This is like the most important movie of my life. You need to see this. This will teach you everything you need to know. And she's like, it's a fucking pig, dude. I mean, <laughs> she's nine years old. She doesn't use the F-bomb, but you right. know, she, that's her attitude. She's like, why am I watching this? Oh, uh, hey, I get it. You know, my kids used to be totally hip on like Star Wars and stuff like that when they were young. Because for me, you know, the two most impactful films in my life were Jaws and Star Wars. You know, Steven yeah. Spielberg, George well, Lucas. You know, and, as, and you if, know. You read the, if you read the introduction to Recovery Movie Meetups, here, let me read this to you. And this is... yeah the message which is you know the story is almost like the star wars story there's a reluctant hero luke skywalker wants to improve his life has a weakness his addiction or stuck on a planet uh must overcome uh, uh a nemesis which is darth vader which is his self-control he gets uh, somebody to help him luke uh luke gets uh obi-wan kenobi who in rehab would be your sponsor or whomever and they have to fight to blow up the Death Star, basically, which is their addiction, and then transform and change the universe. It's all Star Wars is, you know, Luke Skywalker is you in recovery. And the answer, and the only question you really have to ask yourself when you're in recovery is whether you're going to blow up the Death Star or not. Just figure it out. Yeah. No, uh, the, 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 <clears throat> I, people, I, I think people get caught up in a lot of the, the visual of it. And, of course, the beautiful George Williams. I. I live near Modesto, California, so where George Lucas was born, and they're doing it. Last year, we went and saw Star Wars with the Symphony Live. We just went and saw. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. I you saw were here in Modesto? No, but he, John oh. Williams did the same thing with the L.A. Phil here at the Hollywood Bowl. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a friend that was there, and it's like, oh, man, I got to go down to L.A. for that. So, Oh, when he does the uh, the Empire, the March of the Empire, I mean, that oh. just like everybody in the audience is like basically freaking out. <laughs> yeah. It's so powerful. Yeah. Oh, it's wonderful. Uh, next random question, uh, Pet Peeves. Do you have any pet peeves, stuff that just annoys the shit out of you? Yeah, people who say that they know something, but they're just full of shit. Oh. You know, I, I hate the, uh, I call it the presumption of intelligence or uh, people, and I don't know if it, you call it too cool for school, but I, I just don't like people like George Santos or people like that that just seem <laughs> like they, they come off and telling people they're so smart and so this or that, but they're just full of shit. And it's, 
kind of easy to find out a lot of times, but the um, presumption of intelligence is something that affects a lot of society and leads to a lot of mistakes. We, we trust people to be experts on things. Yeah. And I write about this in the book as well, is that um, the, we, we presume that somebody's an expert on something if they claim to be an expert on something. And since we don't have time to become experts on everything ourselves, um, it's hard to know who's full of shit and who's not. Yeah. So um, I, I've tried to spend a lot of time and sometimes some people might think that I'm full of bullshit. I, you know, that's possible as well. But um, I do like to back up what I say or do with facts and knowledge and, you know, et cetera. And I like people to disagree with me. And, and I listen when people disagree with me. In fact, I don't turn away. I, I go right, uh, to me. The obstacle is the way. That's yeah. something that my mother told me. And I, I live that. Every, that's, I recite it to myself every day. Wow. Um, and, and I think that that's that pisses me. I hate people who just come off like they're all that. But. You, when you ask them a couple of questions, they fall like a house of cards. Yeah. And now yeah. what's really great is that chat GPT to the rescue. You know, <laughs> when I've got somebody on a call, I can chat GPT a question or something and have, you know, the, the facts at hand to know yeah. if they're really to fa- kind of fact check people. Not that I do that all the time. I don't have to, but, but in business, sometimes I've had to do that. Um, yeah. And so, you know. Yeah. It's, it's been incredibly dangerous and especially when it's, the other side of that, from my perspective, is when someone is factual, but people just don't want to hear it, so they dis- oh, yeah. discredit. Yeah. You know, it's just like, I mean, how much, how much have we seen that? It's- well, I mean, you know, a lot of a lot of that is happening. Not to get political, but that happens a lot. Is that you know, there's certain things that people don't want to uh, want to believe, and and so unfortunately, in this in most societies, people can choose what to believe. And, yeah. but I like to say, don't, don't believe everything you think. Um, yeah. And don't think that belief is absolutely absolute. I, you know, have to be open-minded and, and again, you know, changing your mind is difficult. Yeah. You know, so, oh, so God, if yeah. it doesn't conform to what you already think, you know, then you're going to fight it. Uh, the barrage of it, right. I could do so many different impressions of people over the last four years, everything from, you know, many things and know many things to, you know, to, to the CDC shoving shit up our bullshit up. Our, yep. It's like, Oh my God. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Who's trying to control what always question that narrative and why they're trying to control it so much. Anyways. Um, yeah. Let's go with this one here. This is a this is a new one. I haven't. Uh, I don't think okay. asked. Uh, biggest misconception that people have about those of us in recovery. Oh, I think the biggest misconception that people have in recovery is that we're uh, is that we're fundamentally flawed, and that this problem will be reflected in negative consequences and other things that we do in our life. So that we're untrustworthy somehow. Mm-hmm. And um, I liken it to, for instance, but I see it as, as a superpower. I see it as the other way around, quite frankly. Like, for instance, you know, we were brought up to think that priests or religious people were highly moral and that they were way more trustworthy. In fact, there's an entire business model built up around evangelicals who want to do business with other evangelicals because they think that they're more trustworthy. That may be true. Not, I'm not bashing on evangelicals at all, and I'm not talking about religion at all. But there, but there are there are bad agents in everything, and so the presumption that a person is going to be better because they're in a particular group or a particular profile or a particular belief is not true. I mean, that's why we have the child sex abuse scandal with the Catholic Church. You know, we're, we assume those people are great, but it turns out they're not. So I think it's the same thing with with uh, with addiction and recovery. People just presume that we're flawed and that we're going to make mistakes. I would rather do business with somebody who's in recovery and understands recovery because I know that that person is going to be more trustworthy because they knew what it was like to not be trustworthy. Mm-hmm. And now, I'm not going to be an idiot and be like, all right, if they're drinking cocktails at three o'clock in the afternoon, no, I'm not going to, you know, that's not acceptable. But if there, you know, if I have a good indication that that somebody is so, in fact, I'm going to hire somebody who's in active recovery right now, um, and and pretty new to recovery, but you know he gets it. So you know, I think that um, the presumption of of guilt by association to addiction is flawed. I think addiction is our superpower, and it makes people better individuals 
more honest individuals and individuals who know themselves a lot better than those who are still living in the matrix. Yeah. And I think a lot of that, especially for people that that have an experienced recovery or maybe have a, a loved one firsthand in, and they view it as a moral failure as opposed to an illness, a disease that that it clearly is, you know, it's a, it's a thinking problem. It's a, you know, it, it's, it's a complicated, just crazy, wacky. Yeah, uh, that's, and the stigma associated with that is, and a lot of people have done a lot of stuff about that. I did a couple of videos about stigma, the whole, you know, the way that society looks at that and how there's a great group of people who see um, addicted individuals as like, it's their fault. They fucked up. They deserve to pay. The only way to teach them is through pain and jail time. That'll teach them. You know, it makes no allowances for where they came from, what they're all about, what opportunities they had or didn't have, how they were treated as a kid or their genetics or what their situation was. It's all like you fucked up. Now you're going to pay. Well, that's, you know, and the, the whole war on drugs. I write about if you want to know, uh, there's. I did a whole chapter about the war on drugs and Good. for madness and, and all that and how, you know, Billy Holiday, et cetera. Oh you know, gosh, the, the vilification of the ed, of the addicted individual. Just say no. I mean, you know, crack queens, all those horrible labels that people gave to people. You know, those are it's highly damaging, and it doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help them. Certainly, it just galvanizes people against somebody who needs help. You know, would you go into a cancer ward and be like, "Oh, that dude's got cancer" with a capital C? No, of course not. You'd be like, "What a bummer!" That guy's not. Not that we're going to debate the disease model, but I'm saying, you know, compassion radical forgiveness yeah yeah no and we're, and i think we're just in such a height of not seeing that right now you know it's being in the thick of it at times said with discussions and different things that people you know harm reduction and you know um decriminalize and you know there's a lot of people that say a lot of rhetoric and don't even know really what the hell it means because yeah okay i agree it's not a moral failure as someone in recovery but it's also not humane to just let someone be out there on the streets using and dying. And when do we come to that place of compassion and actually yeah. take some action? I mean, yeah, I mean, what would Jesus do? Jesus would run a detox facility. He would give people methadone. He would hand out needles. He would he would tell people that it's OK. He'd help them in a recovery. He wouldn't put them in jail. He would lift them. He would lift them off the street and take them to a warm bed and give them food and tell them, give them hope. You know, that's what Jesus would do as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and don't get me on the war on drugs because, boy, yeah, yeah no, that's a whole other show, dude. Oh, yeah, that's some fucked up shit. One of my favorite ones to point out, we got the Just Say No program and then closed up all the mental institutions all yeah, in one false perfect. swoop. Right. Way to go. Good job. Way to go, guys. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Ted, this has been a real pleasure. Um, it's, I'm going to leave you with the final thoughts. Anything that you want to lend just from your experience? Uh, you know, we have listeners, some people, it's they're in recovery or still seeking it or sober curious or a loved one of someone we have. And some people are just fascinated by the topic. So whatever you might want to throw out. Oh, well, thanks. Well, listen, you know, uh, recovery movie meetups is starting in facilities and in and, and organized fashion where anybody has a TV. But, but quite frankly, I would love to see individuals feel comfortable starting their own recovery movie meetups and getting copies of, of the book and, and maybe starting their own little recovery movie meetup clubs. And it's real simple. It's, it's a way to form a, a, a connection and a community locally where you get a couple of buddies that you know that are, that are like you are in recovery. And you can watch a movie together or you can watch a movie on your own time. And then you sit, sit together in a library or a coffee shop and go through the workbook and talk it out and say and answer the questions and use use it if it helps use it or, or not. Um, I think that would be wonderful to have be sort of like an organic growth of individuals who are not necessarily experts in recovery or clinicians to actually start meetings, you know, organically around the country. And that's that started with a couple of people. And I think that's it's really, really fun. And it's it's like low cost, no cost. And just I think it's a fun thing to do. It's another way to do recovery with your buddies. I've got a guy who's who's starting in Chicago. I mailed him a bunch of books and he's starting all these individual meetings at like movie theaters and sober, curious bars and and, you know, uh, special meetups with for other affiliated events and doing with sober, the sober curious crowd. There's a lot of people who 
not necessarily identify as addicted individuals or say that they're in recovery, but they're sober curious. And they think, you know what, it's kind of cool to be sober. You know what? I'm, I, I sort of decided to become sober and now they want sober events with other sober people and, and watching movies with other sober people is something you can do. It's something to do. Yeah, so. absolutely. Hey, this has been a real pleasure. We'll make sure to put all the links in the podcast description so people can find out about it, uh, get the books, maybe sign up. I personally went and signed up on the I website. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, hey, I'm a curious person, so I'm going to I'm going to put it towards good areas you now. So, Ted, this has been a pleasure. Likewise, Jason, thank you so much. And hello to all your entire community. It's so nice to meet everybody and and uh, reach out Ted at recovery movie meetups dot com. I'm always open 365. I answer every email and, uh, you know, here to help. And, you know, if you want to tell me about your story and how I can help you with that too, great. I'm, I'm all ears. I'm, I'm here. I'm at, at everybody's service all the time. This is the Knocking Doors Down podcast featuring celebrities, experts, and everyday people who have overcome adversities, including addiction, mental health, and trauma to live purposeful lives. And that's what Knocking Doors Down is all about.